Welcome to the Franchise Masters Podcast, where aspiring entrepreneurs learn what it takes to find, buy, and build successful franchise businesses. My name is Drew Carpenito, and I'm your host as we dive into these fascinating behind-the-scenes stories of people who have used surprising franchises to create massive success. I'm glad you're here. Let's dig in. Welcome to the Franchise Masters Podcast. I am joined by a brand that a lot of people talk about that kind of came out of nowhere a few years ago. I'm joined by multi-unit operators of KidStrong, Jasmine and Zan Carr. Welcome to the podcast. Glad you guys can make it. Thanks for having us. We're excited to be here. Yeah. And you guys um, down in Louisiana, right? That's that's home base right. for your multi-unit operation? That's yep, awesome. that's correct. Were you guys from Louisiana originally? So I was born and raised in Louisiana. Uh, Zan was born and raised in Mississippi. We met here in Louisiana. And then uh, together we relocated to Dallas, Texas uh, when we got married. Oh, nice. And you guys were doing the corporate thing, right? In Dallas before Kid Strong? That's correct. Yep. I was in uh, I was in healthcare, uh, in the healthcare sector. Uh, and Zan was in marketing and business development. Um, and just... Yeah. I mean, well, I don't want to dive into it too much yet, but I, I was in the world of marketing and business development and that actually is what paved the path of, of meeting the CEO and founder of, of KidStrong. And how did that connection happen? So quite a few years back, I was involved in launching a very well-known boutique fitness brand. We were building them out across this, the area of North Texas. And my paths crossed with Matt Sharp, the, the founder and CEO of KidStrong. And he reached out to me one day and said, hey, look, you know, I know with your background with marketing and also being a father of young kids, I want to run this, this idea by you. I'm working on this concept in the back room of one of my CrossFit boxes in the middle of Kentucky, uh, this programming for kids. And, you know, I just want to run it by you. And he, he ran it, ran it by me immediately. I mean, it was, I was sold and I know Jasmine wants yeah. to tell the story from there, but yeah, it was super exciting. And I came, I came literally running through the front door at home and I was like, Jasmine, I have something to tell you. I have no never way. seen him that excited about something, but he, and, and it's, it's kind of funny because he came home and he was like, I'm, I'm sitting on the floor with our two kids. I'm pregnant with twins at the time. And he's like, Hey, so I talked to this guy named Matt today and he and his wife are doing this thing with kids out of Kentucky. And I can't really explain it, but we're going to get behind them and support them. And there, there's just nothing like this out there right now. And if our kids need it, I can't even imagine how many parents are looking for something like this for their kids. And I was like, okay, wait a minute. Um, we're going to get behind people and support them. And we don't know who they are. And you've literally had a single phone conversation <laughs> with them and they live halfway across, across the country. And you can't even explain this concept to me. I don't think that's going to happen. That's not reality. Um, he is very persistent and you guys will learn about that through this call. Um, he's very, very persistent. So he spent, uh, quite a long time trying to convince me that that was a good idea. And I grew up in corporate America. I thought retirement was a 401k savings. I had no plans to diversify in any single aspect anytime soon. Um, but he was different from me. And, and I knew that from the first moment I met him, he was always talking about being his own boss and setting his own schedule and not reporting to anyone and doing his own thing and doing things his own way. Um, which me being in corporate America, that's not what I was used to. I was like, you do you. And I'll be over here. Yeah. Um, and, and just over time, he just started uh, convincing me that there there is a change in direction for us that makes sense. So um, it, it was kind of funny. And then uh, he surprised me another two months later, and he was like, "Hey, so Matt and Megan are actually going to come stay with us, stay with us in our house this weekend. We had just moved into a new home. They're going to come stay with us. They want to get to know us, um, and and they want to kind of." talk us through what they've been, what they've been working on. So they came and spent a weekend with us, um, with their kids, they brought their kids with them. So we really just got to know the family. Um, and over the course of the next year, we spent time talking with them almost on a weekly basis, just yep. learning what their plans were and what their vision was. Um, and the next time they came down about a year later, uh, Zan had lined up, he'll, this is how persistent he is. Uh, he lined up um, a team of investors to invest into the first Texas location. He found real estate for them to look at. And over the course of that year, he was working on me to say, Kid Strong is, is our future. But he was also working on them to say, 
Frisco is your future. Like you guys need to move here. This is where you need to be to open up your next location. Right. Um, and after that, that second visit with us, uh, they went home, packed up, listed their house and relocated. So our they kids were the They first... relocated to, to Texas, to Dallas, the Frisco area? That's correct. Wow. Yep. yep. You are persistent, yep. Zan. Holy moly. I had, I, I, I had to be. Yes. I mean, you know, it's, it was just part of, I, I think the hardest conversation in the beginning was when talking to some of my colleagues, you know, who became investors, it was pitching an idea of something that didn't really completely exist. But I knew if they got a chance to talk to Matt and Megan Sharp, which both of them are very dynamic, very inspirational people, that they could sell them on on the idea. Um, me, I'm more so of a I'm a connector. I like to bring mm -hmm. people together, and and that's essentially what happened here. It was a kind of a perfect situation, a perfect storm, and had the right team of people that were willing to to get behind it from a financial perspective. That's amazing. So you guys learned about KidStrong when it was kind of an idea. What was it even a franchise when you first heard it about it? it? It was not. It was, okay. It was actually not even yeah, and it was actually not even called KidStrong when we first got involved with it. Yeah. That came a little bit further down the road. So okay, so fast forward, the founders moved down to Frisco. You help yep. them rate find some investors. Was that the pro was that like the first location that was opened as the prototype of the model or yep. had there been some that other was the first that was the first freestanding location. So the flagship location is in Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky. Okay. Um, and then Frisco was the first freestanding. Um, and then there were several iterations past that. Uh, started with a single floor model. They they moved to a two floor model. So the really cool thing about it was when the first location in Texas opened, we put all four kids in. So our oldest was five, our middle was three, and then our twins were 18 months at the time. Um, and what we saw through our kids in a very short period of time from a physical growth perspective was pretty phenomenal. Um, and and I, I think we would like to think that our kids are athletic, right? All parents want to want their kids to be athletically inclined and, and be able to keep up on the playground and things like that. Um, and we thought that about our five-year-old and then we put him in kids strong and we're like, oh man, you're like your speed and your agility and your balance and everything needs some work. Um, but what's really cool, fast forwarding to where we are now, our twins, when they were five, they were able to climb a rope from the bottom to the top. At four, they were crossing the monkey bars. At three, they were riding a bike without training wheels. And that's because they literally grew up in the program. So mm. um, it really helped advance their physical literacy. And not only that, what we took home from their classes was pretty cool too. So we were incorporating some of the teachings and some of the things that we learned through Kids Strong. I think one of our kids, um, uh, one of our twins was an early walker. And one thing that we learned with Kids Strong is that's not necessarily a good thing. And parents kind of lean on that as being, oh, my, my child's so advanced. I, he's walking so early. Um, but it's actually setting them back a little bit because they need that coordination of the left and right movement with their hands and their legs moving at the same time. That's something I would not have known through Kids Strong. And we were able to practice even with an 18 month year old crawling and making it fun at home for them because I knew that was working their brain the way it needed to. And that was helping their body grow the way it, that it needed to. So we were learning a lot and incorporating that stuff into our, our personal lives at home too. I didn't realize there was that much science and yeah. developmental aspects with, with kids mm -hmm. behind it. Where did, where did all of that come from? Was it the founders had a background in this or? Yeah. Megan has a background in um, physical education uh, she was a, a PE teacher for school. And then Matt has a background in tech and, and programming and everything like that. But what's really cool about it is that Kids Strong attracts, uh, attracts really, really good people um, to be in their HQ team or, or work in their centers. Um, so the programming was designed by um, OTs, pediatric um, physical therapists, pediatricians, CPTs, CPTs uh, teachers. So Matt and Megan really started surrounding themselves by experts in child development. And you see that throughout Kids Strong now is that our programming, we still have this board of advisors that has mm -hmm. all of that background. And they're looking at what kids should be able to do. How do we advance them? What are the milestones that we're looking at um, from a growth mindset perspective? What do we want to focus on? What's missing uh, in 
kids that are leaving high school today that we can start working on now. Public speaking is a big piece of that for us. So mm -hmm. if you think in the future, um, uh, public speaking, when you think about public speaking, it's really about like standing up in front of a audience of people. It's not just that it's about being able to raise your hand in a classroom and answer a question that a teacher is asking. And a lot of kids are very nervous to do that, but kids strong works on that skill in our class month after month after month. And our kids that go through kids strong have no problem raising their hands in the class and being the center of attention and being called on and speaking up in front of their peers. That's awesome. I think a lot of times when people hear the name Kids Strong, they, they think it's just a gym for kids. And that's not what it, I mean, it's it's whole child development. Mm -hmm. It's not just the athletic skills, but it's it's you know, it's what we say helping them win at life at all aspects. Yeah. And it's it's pretty cool too. If we look at like testimonials that come from parents, the biggest testimonial that we get is the increased confidence that kids have through the Program. Um, it starts with that physical literacy. And when we're building that up, the confidence starts to starts to pull up as well. And then kids start thinking, well, if I can't do it yet, I know what I have to do to try to get there. And then that starts that goal setting for them. So it's a really cool cycle. Oh, yeah. My uh, I feel kind of embarrassed saying this. My I have, I have twins. We were talking about earlier offline how I have twins that are 10 years old, boy and a girl. And our son has had some developmental delays and one of them is, is uh, apraxia and it's, you know, a speech thing, but it also kind of affects his whole body and his coordination and everything. And for a long time, like we, we found that the trampoline parks have been a good place for him just to go to kind of like, you know, exercise the, the body in a way that you can't necessarily do every day, but there was nothing, there's nothing like, like, like kid strong mm -hmm. available when he was coming up um, at the time. So I, uh, I totally, I totally can see it. And, I feel embarrassed saying this. I I had never heard of physical literacy. I'd never heard that term before, but it makes it makes a ton of sense. I had not either. Yeah, okay. I had not either. And it's strong, but again, it makes a lot of sense when you start thinking about the the developmental needs of kids and and how they need to be able to move their body to avoid injury in the future, or um, just to be able to do all the things that kids need to be able to do. Well, um, and then in the adult fitness space, we always say movement is medicine. And but you know, being able to to then apply that theory to with with children and and knowing that they are able to retain that knowledge and seeing it firsthand and yeah. seeing how how much they are able to grow in a very short period of time, you know, it it proves that 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 saying is true. Yeah, it's a cool concept. So when did you guys get involved as franchisees? So as soon as that first location opened in Texas, uh, Zan said, all right, so we're going to start franchising this. And it still was not a franchise concept at that point. And I was like, it's not a franchise concept, like slow your roll. And I was still in, in corporate America. Um, but, it, and while I was in corporate America and I did like it for a very long time, I spent like 16 years there. Um, it, it, we got to a point where it just did not fit with our, with our work, with our work life balance and, and what we wanted for our family. Um, so right when that first location opened, he started talking about franchising. Uh, it took him about two years to work on me, uh, to get me to the point that I was like, okay, yes. Uh, and, and I hit that, I hit that wall. Um, I was commuting three hours a day. I was missing a lot of time at home. Um, and, and we did not want that for our family. So, uh, we signed on to be developers still before an FTD existed. No, um, that's, really? Oh, that's, that's awesome. how much yeah. we've been, that's how much we believed in kids strong. Uh, but Louisiana was home for, uh, for me. And, um, when we signed on, we said, we want to take this home. We want the program that we love for, for our kids to come home with us to the communities that we love. So we brought it home to Louisiana um, we also started developing Alabama recently and then, um, yeah, I mean, I think initially we committed to the state of Louisiana, um, along the way we had the opportunity then to acquire the majority of, of Alabama. Um, we're wrapping up the deal with Mississippi and, uh, early on, we actually had, uh, Atlanta, Georgia as well. Um, but we were blessed yeah. to have the opportunity to part ways with that and sell to private equity early on. Oh wow! You guys sold to private equity. Oh, I know. I think I know who you sold to. Starts yeah, for with the Atlanta market and ends at yeah. a five. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, that's awesome. So you guys, so you guys, you guys were looking. You guys got involved before they had formally 
started franchising, how many locations had opened at the time that you guys made the decision to get involved? They had, well, uh, they had, we were number seven to open. So they had six locations yeah. and there were two other developers that signed on literally right before us, um, before there was an FTD. Um, so they, they, they were ahead in their development schedule than we were, um, because Dan was still working on me to, to leave corporate America and go all in on kids strong. So, uh, we were, we were the third group to sign on. And I think after us, that's when the FTD came about and, mm -hmm. and everyone else kind of fell in under there. But, um, but yeah, we opened our first location, uh, in September of 2020. So right after the COVID shutdown. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. A couple of things we can unpack there, but. So you, you, you had the advantage, you knew the founders, you'd work with them for a couple of years. You kind of seen it firsthand, been mm -hmm. involved in helping them expand and, and mold and evolve their, their concept. Like Zan, at what point were you just like, this is it. Like, I know, I know, I believe, like, I believe in the idea, but sometimes like when you believe in the idea, obviously there has to be a financial reality to making it worth it. Right. Like what, at what point were you just like, Hey, this is it. I know this you is, you know, it. I'd seen what other brands in the adult boutique business, you know, what, what they, what they were accomplishing. And, and during that time, I mean, you know, the massive expansion of orange theory and, and F 45 and so many of these other great brands and, you know, just seeing what that was doing and knowing that that potentially in, in the kids space, that potentially could be kid strong. Also, we did tons and tons of research. We knew that what somewhat existed in the space was started 30, 35, 40 years ago. And then, and it, never evolved over time and so we knew that this would be the next big thing just based on our experience based on what we know um, about the market now the financial piece just like with any other investment i mean you know with there, there there comes a certain level of risk for sure and and that for for me and jasmine we'd worked really hard uh to save up money <laughs> over many years um 401ks and all this other stuff or people would, were telling me I was crazy that we mm -hmm. were crazy you don't pull from your 401k until you're ready to retire but we we believed in this enough that we knew um that our money would be in good hands and we you know we took that that risk and uh luckily you know we're very blessed that it has certainly paid off um but it's not done I mean you know 100 locations coming up soon and and hundreds of more uh in the near future yeah so you guys opened your first one September, 2020 and had COVID was COVID. I would imagine still affecting the business at some point, so, right? That's correct. Yeah. COVID, COVID was definitely affecting the business. Um, there, when we opened our doors, um, the COVID shut hadn't had passed, um, kids were back in school, but there were still a lot of restrictions. Youth sports was shut down, uh, for a long time after that point. Um, there was social distancing in schools, um, kids were eating lunch in their classrooms, things like that. So there wasn't a lot of uh, opportunity for the physical movement that kids needed um, and the social socialization that they needed. Um, so when we opened our doors, parents found us as a resource um, to allow their kids to get all that physical movement out, um, get their kids out of the house, um, but also have their kids socialize with other kids and parents be able to socialize in the lobby with other parents. Um, so it was a very nice space um, for families to kind of come together and, and remember what it was like a little bit before, before everything got crazy on them. So you guys, so a lot. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to kind of add to it too, because mm -hmm. we, we were asked this kind of often because when people find out when, when we opened kids strong Prairieville, which is a suburb of Baton Rouge, during the kind of the, the height of all things COVID. And they're like, man, that must have really hurt your business. And for us, it, it really didn't. And, and honestly, it gave us a chance to, to kind of take a breath, to, to breathe, yeah. to start the planning process, creating strategy, right? Of, of when this world reopens, like, what are we going to do? How are we going to crush? You know, all these things that we're going to put in place. So for us, we took advantage of the pandemic. And um, I think our businesses have thrived because of that. I would say so, because uh, you, you you got a few more open since then, right? Sure. That's correct. Yeah, we have uh, five open. We just signed a lease for number six. Um, the LOI is out for number seven, and uh, he's still looking at more spaces for eight and nine. So nice. uh, just 
full steam ahead for us. So with that, with that time to kind of, you know, after you get your first one open world, you know, weird place in the world, sounds like it was a positive thing for your business as a place for families and kids to come to maybe get back to normalcy, feel normalcy for a little bit. But yeah, as, as you guys mentioned, you were doing some planning and strategy and, and a lot of thought into planning your expansion. Was there anything that, that kind of happened during that brainstorming phase or time that you look back on and you're like, wow, like, you know, we can point to that, that time when we just kind of chilled out and said, Hey, like, let's take a hard look at all this with all this stuff that's going on in the world. Was there anything that could you guys kind of look back and you're just like, okay, well, that was the, that was the time that this happened that then led to this. And, you know, obviously led to us having five, six, seven, eight locations on the horizon. Yeah. I think uh, if I'm, if I'm pointing to anything specific, I would say it was the team building that we did during that time. So, mm. and, and what I mean by that is in order to scale, you have to have a team that is prepared to scale. Um, and our experience with Kids Strong prior to moving to Louisiana um, and the fact that our kids grew up in the program, um, they were trained by the best of the best coaches in GFW who are hired and trained by Matt and Megan Sharp. Um, so we knew exactly what we were looking for. And the bar for us was extremely high um, on who we were going to bring to our team and who we were going to um, bring in as coaches. Um, and it's it's pretty cool because we didn't have a Kids Strong Open in Louisiana. Um, and we knew who we were looking for, but we really didn't know how to measure them up against what our what we knew we needed um, unless we could see them perform with our kids. So we ended up hosting auditions in a park uh, and our our kids were trained by the best. So they knew exactly what good coaching looked like. And after the end of an audition, we would talk with the kids about the strengths of the coach that they, that they met with. And we'd ask them questions days later, days after that, uh, that audition to see if they still remembered the name of the coach, if they still remembered what that coach took them through as far as the warm up goes, um, what stood out to them. But while they, while they were working with the kids, we were sitting back and we were assessing their uh, command presence, their ability to perform and engage the parents, which is a big part of Kids Strong, um, their ability to teach the kids and mentor the kids and things like that. Um, and then we picked our kids' brains after that. So um, it, it's pretty cool because the first two hires that we made uh, during that that time are now our regional team members. No way. Uh, so they've been able to open that first location and grow with us as as we've grown and expanded. So your kids are, have a pretty good have a pretty good nose for talent, huh? Correct. <laughs> That's funny. Yes. That's awesome. That's so smart, though. So what, like, as you as you as you were building your team and as you currently are expanding your team, are, are there like who do you do you hire on attitude? Do you look for specific things in people's backgrounds or any kind of specific experience? How do you do you still hold all auditions like that? How have you how have you kind of gone about building your team since then? Yeah. So if we're opening in a new market and there's not a kid strong around, we will host auditions. Um, if we have a kid strong around, then we'll have them come in and watch classes and, and really train them, train them up on the floor in an, in an, in an existing center. Um, so I think that's the. Yeah. I mean, we, we do things uh, yeah. based on like, we call it kid strong coach DNA or kid strong director DNA. So there, I mean, there's, there's things, certain qualities that we look mm -hmm. for, you know, you don't want to, for us, at least, we don't want to hire uh, all of our coaches to be exactly the same. I mean, otherwise, that's going to be a little boring. So you want someone that's going to be a performer, someone that's going to be a leader, someone that's going to be uh, a teacher, um, you know, just different backgrounds. One thing you'll hear us say a lot is that we don't hire just to hire. You know, we truly look for the best of the best um, people that we know that we can give the tools and the training to, but ultimately they, they just have something there's just something unique about them and that's where we call them a, un a mm -hmm. unicorn i mean that's what we're looking for it's just something that is just very very special and that separates them from every other applicant that comes through the front door and i think yeah. that to expand on that one of the kids strong core values is um we're a who first company so if we can find an, an individual that is passionate about the brand and and really believes in the mission we can find a good spot on the team for them um it is and Matt Sharp says it all the time. It is more important to hire right 
then train because you can give all the training that you need to someone, but if they are not the right person, if they're not passionate about the job, they're not gonna to perform to the best of their abilities in that role. So we look for people who align with the mission and then we find the right place on the team for them, which makes that training a whole lot easier because they're doing something that they love and they wanna continue learning. Uh, and then once they're trained up, then it's all about supporting them and trusting them through the process. Um, when I pivoted from uh, corporate America and healthcare and everything, I pivoted uh, 100% into Kids Strong. So I left that space. And one of my biggest fears in completely changing industries and, and going out on our own was not being able to support the team. So I was not going to let that be a deterrent. I was never going to let allow myself to use that excuse of, I can't help you. Um, so I made sure that I went through coach training. I went through center director training. I ran our first location as center director for six months. Um, but I put myself in every single position that we had learned the role. Um, and that way, if there is ever a need, they can, my, my team knows they can pick up the phone and call me. Um, so the direct opposite of being an absentee owner yes. is what she did. Yes. <laughs> she went a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, I would say you guys yeah. went, uh, you guys are like the definition of all in you relocated your yes. family emerging brand, you know, you had some validation to kind of see what, you know, you could validate that you thought it was becoming what it could be, but still, you know, got in really early, relocated the family, young family. And, um, you know, here you are three years later, right? Yep. That's amazing. Yep. So, yeah. so you guys, <laughs> it's been fun. Oh, so you guys opened your first location, September, 2020, and now you have five locations with a, with a lease on the at least the sixth and others okay. in process. So you guys have opened, right. you guys have been open in like every six months. Like, do you, do you have a, what, what, what has, is there any insight that you, you, you looking back, you, you can offer somebody that's thinking about getting into the multi-unit franchise world as you guys have expanded to five locations in about three years. Um, is there a strategy there or is it just like, Hey, if there's, you know, we know we want to be in these markets. If there's a good, if there's a good lease that pops up, we're willing to take it down. I don't know. Is, is there any, any thought in terms of just like how you guys have, have gone from the single location to the, the multi-unit side of things? Yeah, I would say there's definitely a strategy uh, to it. Um, you can't just wing it uh, in the space, especially with development timelines and everything like that. Um, so there is a strategy associated with it and, and it's a partnership. So Zan is really focused on real estate site selection and, and going through that entire process. And then I lead the day-to-day -day operations for the centers that are either in pre-sale and, or that are open. Um, and then with his marketing and business development background, he really focuses on that for the entire space for us. Um, so it's all about partnership. Um, but we just, we, we have to keep moving forward. Um, and, and we don't, we don't want anyone to beat us to market. We don't want any other concept that could be emerging to try to beat us to market. Um, we're, you've probably heard this in our, in our voices. We're very passionate about the brand and we truly believe in what we are capable of delivering and, and what the programming can do for families and in, in the communities that we're opening in. So we want to make sure that we get there first. I love it. But there is, there is certainly strategy behind the locations, you know, that mm -hmm. we're picking and all that. Um, you know, th th for, for people that are thinking about doing like multi-unit de development, and all that, and that have never gone down the, the path of franchise, I think one of the things I get asked the most about too is just like the finance side of mm -hmm. things too. So if it's an emerging brand, just people need to know that you may struggle finding, you know, finding that entity that will loan you the money. So then, okay, what does that mean? Like, how? How are you going to come up with the capital? You know, open the kids strong. You may need up, to, you know, maybe a half a million dollars. You know, so just trying to figure that out. For more established brands, I realize yes, you can go out and take out an SBA and this and that. But you know, they're they're with a fast growing emerging brand like Kids Strong. Certainly, those have been the challenges of saying, okay, yes, we can go sign a lease, but where's the money coming from? You yeah, know, we have to figure that out too, right? Yeah, yeah. and that's that's really all things that we have had to figure out along the way. Being first time franchise owners is. Okay, the financial piece got that figured out. Now, how do we build out a center and work with architects and contractors, and what do we do about that? And then, all right, now that we we've got that done, what? How do we how do we start running presale and marketing our own business and everything like that? So, while we had backgrounds in marketing and operations and things like that, 
there, there was a lot of new territory for us. Um, but we surrounded ourselves with mentors, um, the people who have done it before people who have experienced it, who have lived it, um, and, and just leaned on them to help guide us along the way. We're, we're drinking from a fire hose, especially with that first location that we opened. Yeah. Uh, but we learned a lot with that first location. I, I've heard the phrase, you cut your teeth on your first location. You really do. Um, and then you apply that knowledge to your second location and your third location. And we're still learning. We, we have five open, but we're learning new things all the time about how to make our current businesses perform better, how to prepare ourselves better for the next location that comes on board. Um, and through that, I think just over time with KidStrong's growth and, and evolution, um, they've been able to support us in different ways as well um, as they're growing as a brand. And that's been a really cool thing to witness. You know, when we when we had those first conversations with Matt and Megan, they were training 30, 40, 50 kids in the back of a box in, in Kentucky. Um, and now we're training 40 plus thousand kids across the country in Canada. So it's been really Insane. cool to see that evolution of, of kids strong and just the continuation of um, innovation that, that kids strong is putting out there is pretty cool. It's evolving. I mean, it evolves mm -hmm. every day. I mean, Matt and I were just texting just what yesterday about just things I'm seeing po like positive change, right? I think the word change scares a lot of people, mm -hmm. but that's the thing about kids strong. It's constantly changing, constantly evolving. And it's just, it's, that's amazing. So as we scale to a hundred plus, you know, very soon on a, not just national, on an international level, it's, uh, you know, you have to have that team in place and, and be able to support that level of change. Mm -hmm. Cause at some point during the growth, the orange theory franchise owners got wind of kid strong. Right. And wasn't there like a mini wave of folks that have had success in the OTF system that started to, well, come into yeah, the, uh, kid strong yeah i mean it was um i, I guess i could say this i mean it, it was some initial posts that we were doing on, on probably like linkedin and stuff and and i was already connected to that brand you know <laughs> i was involved with that brand for quite some time and uh, so yeah oh, so you were involved yeah. with otf before i didn't realize that okay yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I was part of the the management group that launched Orange Theory in uh, North Texas, and uh, yeah. And when I left that, I went into consulting with a lot of uh, other brands, and um, just mainly through LinkedIn. You mm -hmm. know, Kid Strong HQ was posting saying, "Hey, we're we're growing." You know, they would tag me and a few other people in it, and a lot of my uh, connections, a lot of my colleague colleagues would see it and they were like, okay, I, I have to know. And then mm -hmm. some of the big names in the world of OTF, uh, some of the largest developers um, have now since come on board with, uh, with kids strong. So yeah, that's been super exciting. It says a lot. It's uh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's always hard to, I, I kind of see OTF as a little bit of a unicorn in terms of just like what happened to that brand over a 15 year run becoming a billion dollar brand in like what 13 years something like that and um oh it was amazing yeah that it was it was amazing what they accomplished i think the first one we opened was number 129 and now there's what like 2000 locations or something yeah it's it's wild total unicorn but uh then you have like the L5 connection too right that came in and got involved i think with kid strong corporate but they also operate a bunch of orange theories around the the country and that's great a lot, your background and Orange theories and it's uh it's funny to watch. But I think, you know, it, it, well, have you seen that like was Kid Strong ready for like big time experienced operators of a of a you know, I tend to I tend to think that well, I, I say that orange theory franchise operators are a little spoiled, I think, uh to some degree, just like with how that business everything about that business in some some degree. Not that they didn't didn't have to work for it, but there's, there's not a lot of businesses that can rival um, an OTF, but do, did you see like they were they were ready for those kind of operators to come into the system and and open locations? You know, it's it's interesting because as so both Jasmine and I are a part of are on some national committees for Kids Strong. One's called the FAC. There's the MAC on the marketing side. And we're constantly talking to other franchisees and many of them, whether they come from Orange Theory or other brands, you know, we, we do have to remind them that, look, we're still a young brand. Uh, the, the 100th location hasn't even opened yet. So many of them came on board with Orange Theory after it was more so an established brand. 
So I think that's something just to kind of remember um, where we are in, in, in the growth process as a young brand. And for those that were involved with Orange Theory pretty early on, like I was, they remember that there were a lot of challenges. There were a lot of hiccups. Um, you know, Orange Theory, even HQ, it wasn't like it is today, which is you know this major, major um, hub down in uh, Fort Lauderdale of, of some amazing people. Um, back then, it was it was super small. So you know, I think just reminding other franchisees that it, we're still a growing brand, but Kid Strong HQ has has added some amazing people to their to their HQ team, um, which is so much fun for us to be able mm -hmm. to see because as Jasmine said earlier, it, you know, in the beginning, literally it was me, Jasmine, and then obviously Matt and Megan Sharp and maybe two or three other people that every single Wednesday night for weeks, we would meet over Zoom at 8 p.m. every single week. And that was Kid Strong HQ. Like that was it. Um, you know, and, and now to see, the, I don't even know how many employees they have. It's just, they, they have put in the infrastructure and the, the team now to support this level of growth. Did you think, and did the founders think that KidStrong, like the chances of KidStrong becoming what it is today was a, was a real thing? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. I, I remember believed in it. I remember the call. Yeah, I remember the call with me. I don't, I don't know if I should even say this, but you know, Matt and I had a call and he painted his vision for me. And this was after I think we had launched Frisco, I think. Mm -hmm. But he just kind of painted his vision, you know, and at the time you had the flagship in Lexington, then you had Frisco, Texas, and he just painted the picture and said, This is this is the plan. And, and it's it's really cool if if we think back on like what Matt said during those early conversations of what his vision was and where it is now, he's checked all of those boxes. Um, so it's been really cool just to see that vision from someone like that come all the way through fruition and just knowing that it's going to continue to evolve and, and grow. Um, and I don't know, just support kids and support the community is, is, amazing his last text he sent me i think yesterday he said we're just getting started yeah <laughs> i mean that's that's how we left off because we were texting about just some some really good things and he was like and by the way we're just getting started so big things to come for sure yeah i think it's it's always interesting in like the emerging franchise world which i've i've been for 17 years and look i think every brand when they start to franchise right they're like oh we're going to become a national player we're going to have hundreds of locations you know and they all say it right but but what it takes to get there is not, it's not a, it's not an overnight thing. It's a multi-year thing. It starts at the top with the leadership. I mean, obviously it starts with the business model, but then, you know, it's the people behind the brand and it's those early franchisees too, that can make such a difference on the trajectory of, of how the organization does successfully expand via franchising. It's always this crazy stat that I've heard, like, I, I've heard it 16% of the 3,000 plus franchise concepts, and this includes food, only 16% of them ever get to over 100 locations open, which is kind of wild I heard to that. think about yeah. it, right? Yeah, it's like it's like 600 and change of, of concepts. Kind of wild. Yeah, and I, I think something they did early on super smart, and I guess I've never, we've never really talked about this, is instead of selling onesies and twosies, right? Like single units in the very beginning, they were only doing area developer type rights. So, you know, they're like, no, I'm not going to sell you one, one location. You're going to have to buy an entire state or entire region, you know, or some, something like that. I, I think that looking back on it mm -hmm. has, has helped instead of selling just the onesies and twosies, right? You know, we all know many other brands that they'll sell you a single unit like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, looking back, I think that was a, a huge play that they did. So why do you think that area development strategy from the get-go was a good thing for their long-term growth? Well, for one brand consistency, you yeah. know, for sure. They were able to attract some some big names in the world of franchise. Who had experience not, in the world of franchise. Yeah, and not just, you know, I know we've talked about Orange Theory, but not just guys from Orange Theory, but, you know, some some heavy hitters that, you know, are involved with many, many other franchise brands. So when you say area developer, are you like, are you recruiting other franchisees within your states or are you guys, you guys are the franchisee, you bought the rights to develop the states? And 
we and you own are, the rights. Yeah. yeah, it's it's different than like again, like Orange Theory does the AR, you know, the area representative model where they they have yeah. the ability to go, you know. So no, for us, we mm -hmm. we own the rights and we also have to develop what we signed signed up to develop for for that yeah. region. Yeah. So you that was it. That's interesting. That what was it about the AD opportunity? coupled with the kids strong opportunity that you that you felt they were able to recruit folks like yourself to sign up for ADs and also get in some other talented folks to help set the foundation for the early early days within the uh, the organization was it just cuz maybe ADs is a kind of unique concept and the ADs weren't that aren't that common to come by in terms of like being able to take down you know a big area for to control yeah, the rights not to not necessarily, and I, I don't know that we could speak to all of all of that, but I, I think Zan made a good point when he talked about the brand consistency. That was something um, that Matt was very protective over, and and rightfully so. Um, this is this is his baby and and Megan's baby, and um, they wanted to make sure, especially with these first hundred locations, that the level of service at each location is consistent and is the same. If you come to a kid strong in Prairieville, Louisiana, you should be able to get the same service in Miami, Florida, um, or in McKinney, McKinney, Texas. So they wanted to make sure that that level of consistency, the level of coaching, the, the, the look and the feel of each location was the same. So, so they really, uh, did a nice job, um, building up their brand playbook and then protecting it really well too. Um, and, and by doing the area developer model, they attracted the right, um, the right developers that would also be very protective of the brand. And, you know, these individuals also come with the financial resources, typically uh, a little bit, you know, more mm -hmm. access to capital um, than you would see with some of the onesies and twosie type deals that we've seen yeah. other brands go about doing. So um you know, with the emerging brand, like I mentioned earlier, you know, coming up with that capital, finding, you know, how to finance these locations early on was a little bit of a you mm -hmm. know, struggle. So that you have to know how to navigate around that. And I think a lot of the larger uh, developers that came on board early on, they already knew how to do it. Yeah. I mean, I those how those first few franchisees perform can can define the trajectory that that franchise company's long-term growth um will see or not see um and there's a lot of a lot of yep. wisdom in that and um did they have like did matt ha and and his wife did they have franchising experience prior at all or was, was this kind of their first well, foray so into the franchise world so matt and Megan owned some pretty successful CrossFit locations. I know that that's not franchise, but you know they they had some CrossFit locations um, throughout Kentucky. I think I don't want to yeah. say this without knowing for sure, but I think they were probably the most successful CrossFit locations in probably the whole state of Kentucky. Um, he had worked he another company he had founded. He that particular company was a vendor to many franchise brands out there, so he was familiar. Okay certainly familiar with the space. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he had yeah. the chance to have a, a lot of great meetings with some big names in the world of franchise. And, and he, I remember, you know, I would get different calls from him saying, you won't believe who I'm about to go meet with. And, uh, you know, he was able to get in and meet with um, a lot of great people to kind of mentor him, uh, mentor him That's it. throughout this journey. He he's always positioned himself. Uh, he and Megan have always positioned themselves as students, so they're constantly learning and they're hungry for more information. Um, and and they surround themselves by people who who will teach them something new or uh, just give them new information so they can then take that to their business and grow their business. Um, they also are really good at, at, like I said, attracting really strong talent. So they brought in a lot of people on their HQ team that, um, I, I, I don't remember who it was, but I, I've seen it before where you have to hire someone that's smarter than you. Um, and I'm not saying that they're bringing in a whole bunch of people smarter yeah. than them, but they're bringing they're humble. The, the right level, humble. Exactly. Yeah. They're very humble. They're um, bringing in the right level of, uh, finance support, the right level of marketing support, the right level of operational support, um, on their HQ team that can then support the franchisees. Yeah. That's cool. They sound like great leaders of the company. Mm -hmm. 
so back to you guys, you know, and kind of got a couple more questions for you here, but um, long-term, like what's the grand plan for you guys as you continue not only do you have a multi, successful multi-unit operation, you have a successful multi-unit, multi-state operation. What's the what's the grand plan look like? Yep. So so Zan's already uh, nudging me a little bit. So as we're continuing to develop um, kids strong locations, we're also looking for other diversification opportunities. Um, but but our main goal and our our sites are set on continuing to to develop our locations. So we've got the next couple coming on board in Louisiana. Uh, we're going to start developing Mississippi. We're going to finalize our development schedule in Alabama. Um, and then from there, we just really want to build up those centers and build up those teams. For for us and kids, kids strong in particular, it, it was, it's never really been about the money. And I know that sounds a little cliche or whatever, but you know, it, we, we had a goal and it, our goal is to reach thousands of kids across the deep South. And, you know, we, we all know that the statistics that are in place with a lot of Southern states about obesity and heart disease and diabetes. And, you know, that was our goal is to get more kids moving, you know, and, and to be able to provide kids strong to thousands and thousands of kids. We know that the money will come. I mean, the mo money will happen if you're passionate about something usually. Right. Um, but that's, that was never our motivating mm -hmm. factor for this. So we are definitely nowhere near done yet with you know with the number of kids strongs um that we're going to open and one day we'll get to that point then we can decide the next steps but as jasmine mentioned we we are actively also looking at other you know other things to to invest in other other businesses like any good um, entrepreneur some, would right yeah yeah That's right. some of which i think will complement what we're doing yeah. um with kids strong so um yeah a lot, a lot of fun things in the works yeah, well, congratulations. I mean, you guys, you know, what you guys have built and are building and, you know, some of the life changes you had to make to to put, you know, to move to Louisiana from from Texas, to leave the corporate world behind and, you know, bet on yourselves and Kid Strong, but mainly yourselves to, you know, to to build this. Um, it's amazing. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you guys. Um coming on here and, uh, and talking a little bit more about, you know, your journey and your story. And, you know, there's a lot of nuggets in, in, in your story that I think aspiring franchisees or aspiring entrepreneurs or current franchisees that are thinking about scaling, you know, through the multi-unit strategy. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of wisdom in here, but, uh, any, any final thoughts you'd, you'd like to share with, uh, before we, uh, before we wrap it up? I think for, for anyone that is considering a franchise business, um, just making sure that you surround yourself with those that will support you. That, that's a, that's a big key. Um, and, and just bite the bullet. It's fun. Um, <laughs> so it's easy to talk yourself out of it, but it's, it's a lot of fun to, to go with your gut and, and follow your instincts. And well, I'm glad I followed. Well, it took Zan two years, right. To, uh, right. to get, get you on board. That's awesome. You no, know, I think for us, I was lucky enough to have a really good mentor that was in, in the franchise space that was launching a bunch of franchises throughout Dallas. And, you know, I was a sponge. I learned, I learned so much from him. And that's what I would encourage other people to do is, is find, find someone that you can learn from and to, to learn from their successes and, and from their mistakes and to be that sponge and just absorb as much knowledge as you, as you can. Because if you ask them, they'll help you. Right. Most people will yes. help you if you just ask yeah. for, "Hey, can I can I buy a coffee and just pick your brain a little bit?" Yeah, I mean, very that's, few Jasmine people say and I that absolutely that. love that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we we love it when people reach out just to just just for that reason, just to say, "Hey, can can I run this by you?" You know, can I'm thinking about getting involved with X Y Z business or whatever. Can I just pick your brain for five minutes? Yeah. We love it. You know, that's what we're here for is to kind of support others. So on that note. If somebody wants to get in touch with you, what's the what's the best way for uh, anybody who's listening or anybody who has kids in Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi who uh, want to put their kids in your programs? What's the best way to get in touch with you guys? Yeah, uh, to, I, I, outside of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, I'd say just go to the Kids Strong website and find the nearest location to you. And and I'm sure any of the franchisees would be willing to talk with you reach out to the corporate team. You can go to, if you're interested in Kids Strong, you can go to the website and click on Own a Kid Strong and learn more about that opportunity as well. 
Good stuff. Well, I'll let you guys get back to it. Thanks again for coming on here and talking. Of course. Thank, Thank you. you. See you guys. That's a wrap. Hope you found a nugget or two in there that can help you on your franchise journey. And if you ever want to talk franchising, reach out to me anytime.